We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This coming Wednesday marks the 242nd anniversary of the Continental Congress's Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. It's come to be known as the birthday of our nation. Of course, our nation was not really born that day. An idea was. We had a long way to go before we would become a nation. It would be seven years of war with the British followed by four more years of political infighting between Federalists and Republicans before a Constitution could be passed by that Congress. Finally, on September 17, 1787, our nation was officially constituted. When I was a kid, that great schoolhouse rock song taught my generation the preamble of the Constitution. Sing it with me if you know it. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution. For the United States of America. Those were our Saturday mornings. <laughs> July 4th, you see, was just the beginning. And for the past 242 years, we as a nation have been striving to live into that more perfect union. Exodus, which we are in this summer, represents the beginning of Israel as a people. When Moses first went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, in a way it was Israel's declaration of independence. It was just the beginning. There would be ten horrible plagues to beset the Egyptians before Pharaoh relented followed by a daring escape through the Red Sea on dry land with Pharaoh's army drowning after attempting to pursue them. This was Israel's Yorktown of sorts. But there would still be a long way to go. Forty years of wilderness wandering as the people were forged into God's people. Israel, a nation. That's where we are today for our Old Testament reading from Exodus 17. It's a look into the Continental Congress of Israel. As we turn to God's Word, listen for what God has to say to us today. From Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go ahead of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because there the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, 
Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our reading from Exodus is about people living in an in-between time, in between promise and fulfillment, wondering, now what? Old Testament scholar Terence Fretheim writes of the Israelites, this is a community on the move from a past act of redemption, the Exodus, to a promised goal, the promised land. And when a goal is no longer days or weeks away, but months and years, it's easy to lose one's moorings. These wilderness stories, he continues, are increasingly about people stuck between promise and fulfillment. Wilderness is no longer simply a place, but it is a state of mind. Even more, he concludes, it is a typology for the life of faith. In this place, between promise and fulfillment, the Israelites wonder, is the Lord among us or not? It's a strange question to pose given everything that they have witnessed so far in Exodus. How could they be blind to the Lord's presence among them. While slaves in Egypt, they witnessed God impose ten plagues to make Pharaoh an offer he could not refuse, to let the slaves go free. They walked through the waters of the Red Sea on dry land, and they watched Pharaoh's army be consumed by those same waters when they gave chase to them. They have feasted on manna every morning as much as they needed. And every evening, quail, Sinai free-range chicken, just come up to the camp and jump into their pots ready for supper. And yet here they are in the midst of that daily abundance wondering, is the Lord among us or not? Now, I recognize quail have a lot of bones and they can be difficult to eat. And even the bread of heaven can get a little redundant if you eat it every single morning. Kind of like beans and rice in El Salvador. (laughs) But they are in the desert. And they're eating well. If not like kings, then at least like those of us who enjoyed that rectangle piece of pizza, yellow corn, and a tossed salad every Friday for lunch when we were growing up. It was repetitive, but we grew to love it. Is that any reason to question the presence of the living God? Given these miracles in their midst, how is it that these formerly changed, recently liberated, well-fed folks could be so blind to the presence of God. Now, before we get too tough on the Israelites, let us remember they are living in the wilderness, in that place between promise and fulfillment. And the wilderness can be a really scary place to live. You see, the Israelites weren't blind. They were afraid. They feared for themselves, for their children, for their livelihood. And that fear led them to look for rocks to throw at Moses, the one who got them into this mess in the first place. Fear leaves them questioning what should be obvious. Is the Lord among us or not? That question will be asked again and again in the wilderness for the next 40 years. At least 10 more times, the Israelites will wonder about God's presence in the wilderness. But they're not blind, they're afraid. Only faith 
can quench their fear. Moses is our example of faith in this reading. He turns to God, what should I do? And God provides an answer. Moses does exactly what God tells him to do. And in that place between promise and fulfillment, he takes some elders with him and he swings the staff, that same staff that he used to part the Red Seas. He swings that staff at a rock and water flows forth and faith is forged. Wilderness becomes that place between promise and fulfillment where faith is born. The crucible where hope and fear converge and hope prevails and faith is forged. Israel recognizes God is with us. Is the Lord among us or not? That's that's a question born of fear that we might just find ourselves asking in the midst of our respective wildernesses. The wilderness being as much a state of mind as a place. That place we live between promise and fulfillment. We know that place in our world. We know it in our nation, ever striving for that more perfect union. We know it in our community and we know it in our own lives. I've spent this past week, as I mentioned, in El Salvador with our senior high youth group, many of them sitting right down front. It's either their faith or it's an agreement I made with them when we landed after midnight that if they came to church and sat in the front of the sanctuary, I would do the dance they taught me on the work site at the benediction. So you're gonna get to see me dance at the end. It's been a privilege to be with them in El Salvador. They are bright and funny and compassionate and hardworking. They are faithful. And their witness gives me great hope in the midst of these wilderness days for the church, wondering if we're going to survive. If they are our future, our future is bright, my friends. Most of them are rising juniors and seniors, and they're living in a wilderness place, that place between the promise of good grades and the fulfillment of admission to the college of their dreams, with the fear of an average SAT score or an inadequate GPA keeping them awake at night. That's not the last wilderness place these young folks will be. Because life is all about wilderness places, isn't it? It's that place between the promise of a life with someone you love and the fulfillment of life as it's dreamed to be and the fear, what if I never meet anyone and I live my life alone? It's that place between the promise of for better or worse and the fulfillment of until death do us part and the fear of you are not the person I married. It's that place between the promise present in a newborn baby and the fulfillment of that baby living to give you grandchildren and the fear of a teenager in deep trouble. It's that place between the hope of a happy retirement and the fulfillment of golden years and carefree days and the financial realities of the present. It's the wilderness. It can be a fear-filled place a place where we find ourselves asking, is the Lord among us or not? 
But according to the Bible, the wilderness is also the place where faith is forged. In the wilderness, the power of God makes bitter water sweet. In the wilderness, we wake up to manna in the morning and go to sleep with bellies filled with Sinai free-range chicken. In the wilderness, in thirsty desperation, we can take a stick that stokes our memories of yesterday and sling it against a rock of hopelessness and watch that rock split wide open and living water pour forth. Wilderness is that place where we discover once again and again and again, indeed, the Lord is with us. Where is the wilderness for you? Where do you live between promise and fulfillment? Where in your life do hope and fear converge? What would it mean for faith to flow forth in your wilderness world? Being in El Salvador this past week, we found ourselves living in a wilderness place. El Salvador's history is far too complex to recount in a sermon. It is a history filled with violence, civil war, generations of corrupt leadership. The United States has played a role in all of that as the Cold War with the Soviet Union led our government to arm brutal dictatorships that killed tens of thousands of Salvadorans. In fear that communism would take root in Central America. Today, it is our nation's demand for illicit drugs that funds the very gangs wreaking havoc on their streets as well as our streets. Our nation's current immigration struggles are the bitter fruit of seeds of sin sown over decades. We have played a part in shaping that wilderness world of El Salvador. What what if we stopped demonizing those whose lives have been defined by that wilderness and instead worked to help them build a better tomorrow? What if we did that? Our church has been working to do just that. In partnership with Habitat for Humanity of El Salvador and Habitat Charlotte, we work in the neighborhoods of Gethsemane and Fatima and Santa Rosa. Those are neighborhoods in the canton, the community of Los Mogueas, in Huachapan, El Salvador, close to the Guatemalan border. These communities are filled with amazing people who refuse to let fear overcome their hope for a better tomorrow. And this past week, and over the course of almost 11 years now, disciples from this congregation have been slinging picks and shovels of faith against rocks and mud of despair in that El Salvadoran dirt. And you know what's happening? Streams of hope are flowing forth. This past work, week, our young people worked on three homes, representing three families whose lives will be changed for the better by a 450 square foot cinder block home. Cost about $6,000 to build. These are three of the more than 100 families in the Los Mogueas Canton who are drinking deeply from springs of hope flowing forth from simple 
cinder block homes. Together, this past week, we got a taste of the sweet water that is the kingdom of God. Beloved, every day, we live in that wilderness world between the promises of faith and the fulfillment of God's will done on earth as it is even now in heaven. Every day we live in that crucible where hope and fear converge. Every day fear can bubble up within us and the question can come, is the Lord among us or not? We must never let fear prevail. Not in our own lives, not in our relationships, not in our city, not in our nation's policies, our nation striving ever toward that more perfect union, and not in our world. As people of faith, we must sling that stick of hope against every rock of despair that the spring of faith might flow forth. Whenever compassion conquers coldness, whenever justice prevails over inequity, whenever faith trumps fear. Whenever courage prevails, whenever love wins, living water pours forth. Faith is forged. And we know that no matter what tomorrow holds, God holds tomorrow. And indeed, The Lord is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.